from somebody who says the word rape. Very nice, always kind. It wasn't the type of person you could dislike. Grabs her by the ankles, drags her face down 46 feet by a small Japanese elm tree, commences to beat her with the golf club. Very much like if you had taken a pumpkin and, and just smashed it so that you really couldn't tell it was a pumpkin later. Martha wasn't there, so I masturbated in the tree. Well, I'm sorry, this is not very thoroughly normal behavior. Treated them a little differently. You'd hear kids whisper, they're, they're part of the Kennedy. In the history of American justice, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that money, power, and politics can wield undue influence over how a case is handled. In 1975, 15-year-old Martha Moxley was brutally murdered in the exclusive town of Greenwich, Connecticut. Her neighbors, the wealthy Skakel family, who also happened to be part of the Kennedy clan, came under suspicion. For decades, however, no one was brought to trial, leading to whispers that one of America's most powerful families might have taken matters into their own hands and gotten away with it. But in 2002, the Moxley family finally got what they wanted, the trial and the verdict. This is the story of that strangely twisting path to justice. October 30th, 1975, was an unseasonably cold night in Greenwich, Connecticut. It was also mischief night, the night before Halloween. Eggs, soap, and shaving cream were the weapons of choice for the teenagers of this privileged community, one of the wealthiest in the country. In the elite enclave of Bellhaven, a gated neighborhood of about 40 homes on the coast of Long Island Sound, Dorothy Moxley spent the evening painting the trim around the windows of her second floor master bedroom. Her husband David, a managing partner at one of Manhattan's most prestigious consulting firms, was in Atlanta on a business trip. Their two children, 17-year-old John and 15-year-old Martha, had each been out with friends since just after dusk. It was a quiet night for Dorothy until a noise shattered the stillness sometime between 9.30 and 10 o'clock. I heard this commotion of voices. Um, they weren't adults. They weren't little kids. They were probably teenage voices. And I don't know how many voices, and I don't remember what they were saying, but it was enough yelling or talking excitedly or doing something because it made me stop what I was doing and look out the window. And of course, I couldn't see anything. The commotion coincided with other noises in the neighborhood, sounds that seemed strange, even for mischief night. Dogs barked furiously, whined, whimpered, uh, and generally behaved in ways that they hadn't ever behaved before, according to their owners. Having put down her brush to look out the window, Dorothy decided to stop painting and wait in the TV room for her children to return. I didn't really get alarmed until, I guess, John came home. And then I started thinking, now where is she? My mom told me that Martha wasn't home when I got home, and I was like, you know, good. You know, it's, it's, it's about time that I'm home on time when I said I'm going to be home, and, you know, let her get in a little hot water. A radiant girl with an exuberant personality, Martha had blossomed in the year since her family had moved from San Francisco to Connecticut. She had a really cute girlish figure, and uh, she had a sense of style in her clothes, and she was very confident. She really had a lot, great deal of confidence. From the beginning, she was very friendly. She fit right in, always smiled, very nice, always kind. It wasn't the type of person that you could dislike. At the end of ninth grade, after just one year in her new town, Martha was voted the girl with the best personality. If someone had asked Martha the morning of October 30th if she was happy in Greenwich, she would have said, yes, she loved living in Greenwich. Um, everyone was good to us. Everything was good. 
But as mischief night slipped into Halloween morning, Martha Moxley still had not come home. Alarmed, her mother began frantically phoning neighbors. A friend of Martha's reported having seen her last at the home of one of Greenwich's richest and most famous families, the Skakels. The widower Rushton Skakel and his seven children were well known because of their relatives. Back in 1950, Rushton's sister Ethel had married a 25-year-old law student named Bobby Kennedy. I remember being around them as kids and people treated them a little differently. You'd hear kids whisper, they're, they're part of the Kennedys. Martha Moxley had been with two of the Skakel boys, 15-year-old Michael and 17-year-old Tommy, earlier that evening. But when her mother called the Skakel house in the early hours of October 31st, she was told that Martha was no longer there. My mom woke me up 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, said Martha wasn't home. She was very fr frightened. You know, it was very much out of the ordinary for her. She said she'd pulled all over the place. So she asked me to go out and drive around, see if I could find her. And so I drove around Bellhaven and really didn't come across anything. Soon after he returned home, his mother called the police. At 3.48 a.m. on October 31st, 1975, was the first call made to the Greenwich Police Station. An officer arrived at the Moxley home a few minutes later. He searched the house and the potting shed in the backyard and quickly scanned the rest of the lawn with a flashlight. He found nothing out of the ordinary. ...that her daughter would... Waiting on the window seat that looked out onto the front yard, she finally fell asleep. Bellhaven was a small neighborhood where news traveled fast. By late that morning, everyone knew Martha was missing, and they were afraid. It was an unfamiliar feeling in a gated community with its own private security force. Several neighbors now joined Dorothy's desperate vigil. Others banded together to scour the neighborhood for some sign of the missing girl. I got up, I got dressed, I got my sister Holly. We called a couple other friends and made a plan to team up and go out and look for her. Hoping that maybe she just got together some people, grabbed some sleeping bags and were sleeping out in one of the yards. Shortly after noon, another neighbor, Sheila McGuire, cut across the Moxley's property to join the search for Martha. The house was on her right. The yard sloped down to her left. And directly in front of her, beneath the branches of a large pine tree, lay a crumpled and bloody body. Sheila McGuire came to the door and said that she, she was hysterical, she was crying, and said that she had found Martha. She thought she, she had found Martha. And I said, well, is she all right? And she said she, she didn't think so. And so that's when my friends decided I shouldn't go and look. And this one friend said she would go and look and make sure that it was Martha and that she was all right. And she came back in the house in just a few minutes and said, well, it was Martha, but that she was dead. I sat in a chair in the living room and I was afraid to move because I knew if I moved, I, I would fall apart. Greenwich police officers arrived minutes later. It was just a bloody mess. It was uh, very much like if you had taken a pumpkin and, and just smashed it so that you really couldn't tell it was a pumpkin later. We didn't know what color hair she had because everything was red from her shoulders up. In pieces at the scene lay an unusual weapon, a golf club, a six iron much like this one. The killer had apparently assaulted the girl the night before, bludgeoning her with the club until it shattered, then using the broken end of the shaft to stab her through the neck. She was beaten so badly that the pathologist who performed the autopsy was unable to designate one of her many head wounds to be the actual wound that caused her death. John Moxley was at varsity football practice when he heard the horrible news. I was changing my clothes. The coach came up and told me that something had happened at home. My parents wanted me home right away. 
When I got home, um, I couldn't even pull up the driveway. There was police cars everywhere, an ambulance, yellow tape. You know, it was you know, like a scene out of a police movie. Instead of using a regular telephone, a Greenwich police officer had called in his report over an open car radio. As a result, within minutes of the discovery of Martha Moxley's body, Serene Bellhaven had become a media circus. It was the chaotic beginning of an investigation that would continue to haunt the Greenwich police and the town itself for many years to come. On November 4th, 1975, a grieving Greenwich, Connecticut turned out for Martha Moxley's funeral. The vivacious high school sophomore had been found beaten to death five days before. A savage murder that had shattered the sense of security shared by residents of the wealthy community. Among the hundreds of mourners who gathered at First Lutheran Church that day was the nephew of Bobby and Ethel Kennedy. 17-year-old Tommy Skakel. What few at the funeral knew was that the teenager had become a leading suspect in the murder of Martha Moxley. The Greenwich Police Department's first major murder investigation in almost 30 years began beneath a pine tree on the west side of the Moxley property. There, on the afternoon of October 31st, a neighbor had discovered the body of 15-year-old Martha, who had been missing since the night before. Steve Carroll, a 21-year veteran, was one of the first officers on the scene. They'd seen a lot of dead bodies, seen people blow their brains out and uh, drown and that kind of thing, but never homicide. From the beginning, the department's inexperience left its investigation open to criticism. Within minutes after Martha's body was discovered, a crowd of neighbors, reporters, and other policemen had descended on the Moxley's yard. Former LAPD detective Mark Furman, himself no stranger to controversial investigations, has written a book highly critical of how the Greenwich police handled this high-profile case. The crime scene wasn't secure. A crime scene doesn't know if those are cops' shoes or citizen shoes. You know. Uh, ten uniformed cops standing within 15 feet of the body is a contaminated, messed up, chaotic scene. Lacking the resources to handle a violent crime, the department had to call in the Connecticut State Medical Examiner. He was unable to make it to Greenwich Hospital to perform the autopsy until the following day and never viewed the murder scene itself. Because of the delay, the results could only narrow the time of death to a seven and a half hour period between 9.30 p.m. on October 30th and five the next morning. But to critics of the investigation, the department's biggest blunder was its inability, some would say its refusal, to accept that such a horrific crime could have been committed by one of Greenwich's own. By the afternoon of Martha Moxley's funeral, Detectives had largely pieced together the events of the young girl's last night. The story began around 6.30, when Martha headed out with a group of friends, armed with eggs, soap, and shaving cream. It was mischief night. Martha asked, could I go out with these kids? I thought, oh, sure, go ahead. That's fine. After Martha walked out the door that night, I never did see her again. Around 9, Martha and her friends, Helen X and Jeff Byrne, ended up at the Skakels' Bellhaven Mansion. They were greeted at the door by 15-year-old Michael. They stayed in the house very briefly and then left the house, went out and sat into a Lincoln automobile that was parked in the driveway for the purpose of listening to music. They remained in that automobile a short time and were then joined by another Skakel brother, Thomas, who was 17 years old at the time. Martha had gotten to know the Skakel boys that summer. She had even mentioned Tommy in her diary, writing that he was interested in her. Now, as Martha sat between Tommy and Michael in the front seat, Tommy began flirting with her. According to Martha's friends, who were in the back seat at the time, she resisted his advances. 
The information was that at some time while they were in the car, Thomas Gakel placed his hand upon either the thigh or the knee of Martha Moxley. Martha pushed his hand away, and sometime thereafter, he replaced it and put it on the thigh or the knee a second time, and she again pushed his hand away. Then, around 9.15, two of the other Skakel teenagers, John and Rushton Jr., along with their cousin Jim, came out of the house. And they say that the kids have to get out of the car because they're going to take their cousin home. Michael reportedly volunteered to go with them. When he invited Martha to come along, she said no and got out of the car. The four boys drove off. Now that left Helen X and Jeff Byrne, according to both of them, they immediately left to go to their home, leaving then Tom Skakel and Martha Moxley in the driveway. Martha's two friends would later tell police that as they walked away, they saw Tommy pushing Martha, who fell to the ground and out of sight. In talking to Tommy several times after and referring to uh, what Helen said, uh, we asked him if uh, Martha got hurt when, uh, when he pushed her. And uh, he kind of draws a blank and he said, no, no, I, I didn't push Martha. Martha didn't get hurt. Instead, Tommy told police he had left Martha around 9.30 and gone inside to work on a report about Abraham Lincoln for school. But when detectives checked the story with his teacher, they discovered that there had been no such assignment. It was sometime between 9.30 and 10 that Martha's mother, Dorothy, was startled by a strange commotion outside her window. Others in the neighborhood heard a chorus of dogs suddenly start furiously barking. With autopsy results unable to pinpoint the time of the murder, police publicly indicated that these noises marked the moment when they believed Martha was assaulted. Evidence at the crime scene suggested that sexual activity, possibly a struggle, may have played a part in the attack. Her jeans and her panties will pull down to uh just below her knees, and there was one uh, smudge on the inside of her thigh as if it were a handprint that it would appear that maybe somebody tried to open her legs. Tommy Skakel, it seemed, had both the opportunity and possible motive to have assaulted Martha Moxley that night. He also had access to the murder weapon. Leaving the Skakel home the day Martha's body was discovered, Police noticed a golf club bearing the insignia of a former touring pro named Tony Penna. It was the same brand as the shattered six iron found at the murder scene. Forensic testing would determine that the two clubs came from the exact same set. After thoroughly canvassing the neighborhood, police concluded that the Skakels were the only residents who owned that particular brand found a matching set to the murder weapon inside the Skakel house and all the bells should have gone off right then. Yet despite all the evidence that at the time seemed to point toward Tommy Skakel, detectives focused their investigation elsewhere, away from Greenwich's most famous family. We believed that it was somebody from the outside that did it, not one of those nice people from Belhaven. Though the murder weapon was a powerful piece of evidence, Greenwich police realized that merely tying it to the Skakels was not enough to make an arrest. The Skakel kids often practiced golf swings in their backyard, leaving the clubs out on the ground until the next time they played. On its own, then, the broken six iron was no smoking gun. The family would simply claim that any outsider could have picked it up off the lawn. As authorities turned their attention to other suspects, the Skakel family would do little to help police. Some would even charge that they used their power and influence to hamper the investigation. On October 31st, 1975, the brutal murder of 15-year-old Martha Moxley shocked the safe, sheltered city of Greenwich, Connecticut. My mother always says she never knew where the keys to the house were because they never locked it. Uh, people were locking their doors now, being more careful. You're looking over your shoulder. It's just not the way it had been. 
Frightened residents assume that the young girl must have been attacked by an outsider or an outcast. The Greenwich Police Department shared the same suspicions. Despite evidence that seemed to implicate 17-year-old Tommy Skakel, Ethel Kennedy's nephew and the last person known to have seen the victim alive, detectives initially concentrated their investigation on other, less prominent suspects. The first was a 26-year-old graduate student who lived next door to the Moxleys and whose window overlooked the tree under which the teenager's corpse was found. He knew the Moxleys, he'd been, and he knew the Skakels. He'd been to cocktail parties. He had some kind of strange conversation with Martha and also with uh, her mother, Dorothy. So they, they all thought he was a little strange. Detective Carroll and his colleagues interrogated the young man for several hours. They obtained a consent to search form, a kind of voluntary search warrant for his home. They scoured his house. They really searched his house well, went through waste baskets, went through the laundry machines. Finally, after being hounded by police for weeks, the suspect passed a polygraph test and was cleared. Though they had not found the killer, Greenwich detectives had shown a willingness to aggressively go after a homicide suspect. A willingness that seemed to disappear in the presence of the powerful Skakels, one of the town's most prominent families for three generations. In the days following Martha Moxley's murder, investigators searched relentlessly for a crucial missing piece of evidence. The broken handle of the golf club used to bludgeon the teenage girl. Bellhaven residents allowed police to drain their pools, dredge their ponds, and examine nearly every basement and building in their elite community. Yet even though the Skakels owned the only set of clubs in the neighborhood that matched the brand used in the murder, detectives treated the family with unusual deference. At the time, says retired Fairfield County State's Attorney Donald Brown, Connecticut law prohibited sweeping evidentiary searches. What a lot of people don't realize that back in those days, you could not conduct a search for mere evidence. They had no authority to get a search warrant to go in and search for bloody clothing. They had no authority to go in and search for hair in the, in the storm drain. The only thing that they could have gotten a warrant for was the balance of the club that was taken from the removed from the crime scene. And that was all they could have searched for. But police never secured even such a limited search warrant for the Skakel home. Instead, they got the family's permission to search the house and then allowed 18-year-old Julie Skakel to do the looking for them. You don't have any uh, relative of the Skakel family search the house for you. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Along with the consent search, Rushton Skakel Sr. had voluntarily granted Greenwich police officers permission to examine his children's school and medical records. This meant that detectives could pursue certain avenues of investigation, but only as long as Mr. Skakel allowed them to. Initially, he was cooperative, even as detectives began to view his son as a leading suspect. Just hours before Martha Motsley's murder, they learned, Tommy Skakel had received some devastating news. His varsity soccer teammates had unanimously voted to kick him off the team for missing a game. He had left the field in tears. Tommy was a lousy student, but one thing he knew how to do well was play soccer. He was a good athlete. It was the one thing that he could really hang on to and say, I can do this well. The incident led detectives to dig deeper into the teenager's past. We had permission from Mr. Skakel to get any and all information on Tommy. One of the places that I went to was Whitby School. Tommy had attended the private Whitby School several years before. His father was one of its most influential donors. In January 1976, when detectives went to examine Tommy's records, the school's headmaster ordered them to leave. I said, the Skakel boys, plural, must have done some damage here. And I said, did they break statues? I said, worse, I said, they pick on any of the students. And meantime, he's getting louder and louder. Get out. 
Later that day, Rushton Skakel Sr. went to the Greenwich Police Station and angrily withdrew his voluntary cooperation with the investigation. Though Tommy Skakel still seemed like their strongest suspect, detectives lacked any evidence tying him directly to the crime. Now stonewalled by the Skakel family, their search for Martha Moxley's killer foundered. Once again, the department turned its attention to outsiders. In April, six months after Martha's murder, officers were tipped off to a new suspect, a 23-year-old Williams College graduate named Ken Littleton, who the informant said had been acting erratically. Littleton was a teacher and coach at the Brunswick School, an elite prep school attended by several of the Skakel boys, including Tommy and Michael. Their father had hired Littleton to be the family's live-in babysitter while he was out of town on business. His first night on the job, Martha was murdered. Littleton had stayed at the Skakels for several more weeks. He soon began drinking heavily. When Steve Carroll and his partner tracked him down at a Brunswick football practice, his defensive reaction struck the detectives as strange. He started screaming that he was not going to help us build a case against Tommy Skakel. And we looked at him in amazement and said, you know, that's not our job. That's not what we're looking for. On October 18th, 1976, Littleton failed a police polygraph exam. He also admitted to having been arrested that summer for theft. From that day on, Ken Littleton became one of two prime suspects in the murder of Martha Moxley. The other was Tommy Skakel. But without enough hard evidence to arrest either of them, and lacking any other promising leads, the Greenwich Police Department's investigation went cold for years. By the early 1980s, both Prosecutor Donald Brown and the Greenwich Police Department had come under fire for their failure to bring Martha Moxley's killer to justice. Critics accused them of selling out to the Skakel family of allowing a relative of the Kennedys to get away with murder. The investigation was put on the back burner for almost 15 years until another Kennedy scandal renewed interest in the case. In 1975, in Greenwich, Connecticut, popular high school sophomore Martha Moxley was murdered. She had been beaten with a golf club, then stabbed with the end of its broken shaft. Authorities had developed suspects. Tommy Skakel, a nephew of Ethel Kennedy, was thought to lead the list. But there was never enough evidence to file charges. The Moxley family worked tirelessly to keep Martha's murder in the public eye. I had asked all my friends, everyone I could think of, what I could do to, you know, to help Martha's case. But months turned into years. The Moxleys moved away from Greenwich, Connecticut, and the killer was never found. Just before Thanksgiving 1988, Martha's father, David, died of a heart attack at the age of 57. Family members believe that his daughter's murder contributed to his untimely death. I think it probably chewed him up on the inside. I mean, it had to have... I'm just now starting to have an inkling of what it might be like since I have my own children to lose one this way. Um, and I can't imagine anything more devastating. Those remaining in Greenwich were left with the fading memory that the most widely publicized homicide in the town's history had gone unsolved. Then, in the spring of 1991, another Kennedy cousin, William Kennedy Smith, was accused of raping a woman at the family's estate in West Palm Beach, Florida. And how do you defend yourself from somebody who says the word rape? His nationally televised trial focused attention on what some saw as the seamy exploits of the Kennedy clan. A tabloid reported that the accused rapist had been visiting the Skakels in Greenwich on October 30th, 1975, the night of Martha's murder. The sensational allegation was quickly proven false. But I've been living with these... But the media attention it drew transformed the Moxley case from an unsolved murder 
into yet another Kennedy scandal and proved to be the pressure the authorities needed to reopen the case. I defend myself in the coming days. That August, the Greenwich Police Department and the Connecticut State's Attorney announced that they were jointly reactivating the investigation. It was welcome news for the Moxley family. When the William Kennedy Smith trial happened, and all these things just happened automatically. I mean, I didn't have to uh, go out and pound on any doors or call anyone to see if they would like to talk to me. It's all happened. A high-powered addition to the state's new investigating team was Connecticut forensic scientist Dr. Henry Lee, a world-renowned authority in the emerging field of DNA testing. Reportedly shaken by the news that Dr. Lee was now involved, Rushton Skakel hired a high-priced New York detective agency called Sutton Associates to investigate the investigation. Observers of the case have speculated that Skakel wanted to learn whether any of his kids could be implicated in the murder of Martha Moxley. But if that was the strategy, it backfired. After a thorough investigation, the agency reported that Tommy Skakel and his younger brother Michael had radically revised their stories of the night of the murder while speaking with detectives. In 1995, investigative journalist Len Levitt with New York Newsday wrote a series of articles describing the explosive new details contained in the Sutton Associates report, a copy of which he had obtained from one of the agency's detectives. Originally, Tommy Skakel had told police he had last been with Martha Moxley around 9.30 the night of her murder. He then went inside to work on a report for school. Now he says, um, well, I, I left her at 9.30, but I came back out again, and we were having uh, sex till about a quarter to ten. According to the Greenwich police, autopsy results indicated that Martha Moxley was a virgin when she was killed. By sex, Tommy explained, he meant that he and Martha had masturbated each other. The story placed him with the girl right at the time police believed the murder had taken place. If Tommy's reported new account was startling, his younger brother's was simply bizarre. For two decades, Michael Skakel had never been considered a suspect. His alibi supported by a cousin and two of Michael's brothers, seemed ironclad. After leaving the Skakel house at 9.30 to drop off the cousin, the three boys returned around 11.20 and went right up to bed. But according to the Sutton Associates report, Michael now admitted that he hadn't gone to bed, and that he'd left the house 20 minutes later and wandered around the neighborhood. After passing through the Moxley's yard, the report said, Michael climbed the tree outside Martha's bedroom, threw pebbles at her window, and shouted the girl's name. When she didn't answer, he masturbated in the tree, climbed down, and ran home. It is the whopper of all evidentiary cover stories. Martha wasn't there, so I masturbated in the tree. This is strange behavior by strange people. Now we're supposed to assume that this is a fairly normal 15-year-old. Well, I'm sorry, this is not very, fairly normal behavior. The reported new version of Michael's activities placed him everywhere the victim had been, from the spot where she had first been attacked to the tree where her body was discovered. The investigating detectives cannot understand why Michael would put himself at that murder scene. And that has made them very suspicious coming on top of the so-called admissions that he made about his involvement. Levitt believes that the forensic technology of the 1990s had forced Tommy and Michael Skakel to amend alibis they'd maintained since the 1970s. Why would they come up with changing stories unless they feared that they did leave some semen or DNA uh, at the scene, unless it was to cover themselves? If the Skakels had let this alone, they wouldn't be in the hot water there and today. The Skakels themselves have done the best job of making the Skakels look guilty. The case against the Skakel brothers gained momentum in the spring of 1998, when former LAPD detective Mark Furman published Murder in Greenwich, Who Killed Martha Moxley? The controversial detective examined the public record 
especially the new revelations contained in the Sutton report, and then did a little investigating of his own. When he finished, Furman had come to an explosive conclusion. Martha Moxley's killer was not Tommy Skakel, as police had reportedly suspected for more than two decades, but his younger brother, Michael. According to Furman's theory, the two siblings were both attracted to the beautiful girl next door. The night of the murder, Furman wrote, Michael fell into a jealous frenzy after seeing Martha and his older brother together. As she left the Skakel house, sometime after 11 p.m., Furman believes, Michael followed her into the yard. He grabs a golf club, and in a fit of rage, he chases after Martha. Martha gets almost home, and she turns around and he hits her. Maybe he doesn't realize how hard he hit her, uh, but she goes down, she's unconscious. Now, the rage is still there. He grabs her by the ankles, drags her face down 46 feet by a small Japanese elm tree, and uh, commences to beat her with the golf club. Feeling a combination of fear and fury, Michael finished her off, Furman believes, stabbing her through the neck with the shaft of the broken six iron. His theory threw into question long-standing assumptions about the case. For two decades, police had publicly indicated that the murder took place between 9.30 and 10 p.m., when Dorothy Moxley and others heard a sudden commotion outside her house. Drawing on blood evidence from the scene, as well as the changing stories of the Skakel boys themselves, Furman raised the possibility that the attack may have occurred later than previously believed. Furman also drew suspicion away from Tommy Skakel and cast it onto Michael. Even with all the new revelations, Prosecutor Donald Brown, who had headed the case for 23 years, didn't think he had what he needed to file charges. I was always hoping that that little piece of, that, that, that unknown item was going to surface and that we could go ahead and accomplish something. I always had that hope. Mark Furman's book joined others, renewing interest in Moxley's case. In the book, Greentown, writer and Greenwich native Tim Dumas took a close look at longtime state's attorney Donald Brown, criticizing the prosecutor for being overly cautious. Just days after the book's publication, Brown resigned. This turned out to be a watershed in the dormant case. Less than two months later, new prosecutor Jonathan Benedict convened a grand jury. Finally, in January 2000, a murder warrant was issued, not for longtime suspect Tommy Skakel, but for his younger brother, Michael. After almost 25 years, someone was finally going to trial. On January 18, 2000, the state of Connecticut filed murder charges against Michael Skakel, now 39 years old, for beating Martha Moxley to death a quarter of a century earlier. One day later, Skakel turned himself in. At his arraignment, the Moxley family faced the defendant and his family for the first time in decades. For 24 years, they've uh, thought they're above the law. We're going to find out now. Skakel pleaded not guilty to the charges, and his attorney indicated he would mount a vigorous defense. He didn't do it. Michael Skakel didn't commit this crime. Prosecutor Jonathan Benedict, for his part, was staying tight-lipped about his case. I've got a lot of work cut out for me, and just want to get on with it. Benedict faced an uphill battle. Fading memories, no clear physical evidence to speak of, and the fact that the authorities had actively pursued numerous suspects, including Michael's older brother, Tommy, all added up to possible reasonable doubt, and a case most trial watchers termed difficult for the state. And so the final act in this decades-long drama began in May 2002 at Norwalk Superior Court in Connecticut. The state was relying not on physical evidence from the scene, but on what Michael had told people in the years after the murder. No fewer than 11 witnesses testified they had heard Michael either admit to the crime or place himself at the scene. Many of these witnesses knew Skakel from Elon, a strict alcohol and drug treatment center the troubled young man had been forced to attend in the late 1970s. The witnesses had been patients with him, 
and like him, struggled with addictions. This made them easy targets for the defense. This kind of a case brings out the nuts, the crackpots, the hanger-oners, anonymous callers who thinks that somebody from, uh, you know, the plane of Jupiter did this. Harder to explain for the defense, however, were Michael Skakel's own words. The state played an audio tape Skakel made with an author, where he described his bizarre alibi that he was masturbating in a tree outside of Martha's window on the night of her murder. By itself, however, the story couldn't be termed a confession. That author, Richard Hoffman, commented that he had believed Michael Skakel's stories about the crime. I do not believe that Michael killed Martha Moxley. For five long weeks, 25 years unfolded inside the courtroom. The media hordes were kept outside, capturing the daily comings and goings of Michael Skakel and the attorneys, with occasional glimpses of past suspects, Ken Littleton, and Skakel's older brother, Tommy. Skakel and Kennedy family members made sporadic appearances. Dorothy Moxley and her son David were a constant presence. I have great faith in the prosecution and I have a strong faith in our leader up there. Even so, as the case wrapped up, many legal pundits thought the prosecution had not met its burden of proof. Some even characterized Jonathan Benedict's performance as lackluster. Then came closing arguments. Jonathan Benedict reportedly gave a masterful performance, telling the jurors Michael had spun a web in which he has ultimately entrapped himself. He commented on his performance afterwards. I got a good solid hit. Uh, maybe as a grand slam, we'll find out. Uh, I thought we had a pretty, pretty compelling case, uh, and we needed to connect the dots, and, and that's what I did. The jury agreed. After three days of deliberation, nearly 27 years after Martha Moxley was murdered, they delivered a verdict. Michael Skakel, they said, was guilty. Justice de delayed doesn't have to be justice denied. The defense promised to fight on. I will tell you, as long as there's a breath in my body, this case is not over as far as I'm concerned. But the Moxley family had only Martha in mind. I just feel so blessed and so overwhelmed. This is Martha's day. This is truly Martha's day. At the sentencing hearing, Skakel's attorney presented nearly 100 letters written by friends and family, including Ethel Kennedy and her son Robert Jr., detailing Michael Skakel's efforts to help others with substance abuse problems. Skakel himself spoke in his defense publicly for the first time, saying, quote, I would love to be able to say I did this crime so the Moxley family could have rest and peace, but I can't. To do that would be a lie in front of my God. The judge sentenced Skakel to 20 years to life, 